Hello everyone and welcome to today's kitchen session, Beyond the Chocolate Box, The Messiness of Religion. So today's session is delivered by Dr. James Holt, um, our Associate Professor of Religious Education. So my name's Katie and I'm a HE advisor here at the University of Chester. And I'm here today along with Claire and Hayley, who are both helping us behind the scenes. Um, so I'll start by reassuring you that your video and audio are not shared at all during the duration of this session. Um, in terms of how today will work, I'll shortly be handing over to James. Um, so during the presentation, you'll be able to ask questions in the chat function just on the right hand side of the screen. And um, so you can ask any questions anonymously if you wish. You just need to tick the box to say that you wish to be anonymous. Um, you can also like all the questions that people have asked. Um, and you can also answer any questions that James may ask um, just by responding in the in the chat function. So Claire will be asking James your questions at the end of the session. So I think that's it from me. So over to you, James, when you're ready. OK, good afternoon. Good evening. It's that funny time of, of day where I don't know which one it is at the moment. So thank you for for coming to attend this evening. Um, as um, Katie mentioned we're going to be talking about beyond the chocolate box, the messiness of religion. So I think what we'll talk about first of all is what I mean by the chocolate box, because I think this may be an outdated image for a lot of people. And, and when I've talked to people about the chocolate box before, they've talked about, I don't know, the hazelnut worlds and different things. But what we actually mean when I talk about the chocolate box is in the old days, and this, this is before I was born, um, and chocolate boxes um, had beautiful images on them and they were designed in such ways to entice people to buy them based on what was outside and um, I think very quickly chocolate producers um, manufacturers realized that it was what was inside that sold but but essentially there was a beautiful static image that captured a particular moment in time and so it it created this this ideal view of I know Venice or, or whatever it is that we're talking about and when it comes to religion when we talk about the chocolate box or when I talk about the chocolate box what I mean is that we like this staid and static picture of what religion actually is um, so in the sense that well all Muslims do the same thing or all Christians do the same thing it, it makes life much much easier if we are able to say well this is how everybody does it and this is what it looks like and actually what we need to do, to do when we talk about religion whether it's in the classroom whether it's um, in essays or whether it's just in our personal lives we need to recognize that this chocolate box doesn't exist as much as we would like it to and be able to kind of picture everybody as the same it really doesn't exist religion is messy and it's full of diversity and there's lots and lots of different reasons and different ways that we can see this, that it's it's this messy, this diverse thing. And Jonathan Smith has highlighted one of the reasons. Um, and as you can see on here, he says, religion is not a native category. It's not a first person term of self characterization. It's a category imposed from the outside on some aspect of native culture. It is the other, in these instances, colonialists who are solely responsible for the content of the term. So what has happened is that through the period of colonialism, um, the Christian idea of religion has been almost pushed and enabled observers to structure what other religions look like. And I think what we need to do is to de define what religion is. And one of the problems is, is it's, it's a fairly modern term. It's a, con it's a contested term as well. And you might say, well, hang about James. Ancient Greece had religion. Ancient Rome had religion. All of the religion is, is hundreds of thousands of years old. So how we know what it means. And yes, we know what it means today. But when we look at some of the words that, from other languages that have been translated or are translated today as religion what we mean by religion which is or what we tend to mean by religion which is kind of a structure or a way of life that is separate to other aspects of a person's identity is actually a fairly modern construct 
So if we look at, for example, the Latin um, definition or, or the Latin word of uh, religio, this was first used, um, generally speaking, in the, in the first century BCE um, by Cicero. And when he used it, he used it to kind of refer to the worship, the aspects of worship that took place in the temple. So it was actually the rituals, if you like, that it spoke to. And then you think, well, actually, let, let's fast forward to 600 years or so and, and we have the Quran. And there are words within the Quran that if you read in English are translated as religion. And again, these are problematic. So, for example, din um, is an Arabic word that can mean law, but sometimes is translated as religion. So it's more about kind of a, a way of life and the way of living. And Ummah, Ummah is a word that, that continues today, uh, which means community. And so these translations are not precise. And one of the ones that I think is, is probably key in, in my knowledge is, is Dharma, uh, which is a Sanskrit word. And Rasmandala Das, he, he kind of explores and, and develops this. And he says it comes from um, a Sanskrit root, Dri, which literally um, means to sustain but it can also mean that which is integral to something. So it's it's both innate, it's, it's a person's duty or a person's dharma that is a part of who they are and makes them who they are. So for example, the dharma of, a, of sugar is to be sweet. And so what we have is we have all of these words in other languages that translate into English as religion. And actually the translation is not completely correct. And so we have to go back and think, are we imposing our modern idea of religion onto history? And, and in some ways we are. Even more interesting, um, and, and these are a couple of um, examples from Brent Nombry, who has written a, um, the book Before Religion. Um, he says the formation of ancient religions as objects um, of study coincided with the formation of religion itself as a concept of the 16th and century, 17th century. So this is where things began to be structured. And I think really, really interesting in this, as you can see from the, from the top um, paragraph, the first recorded use of Buddhism, spelled differently obviously, was 1801 followed by Hinduism in 1829, Taoism 1838 and Confucianism in 1862. These are words that didn't necessarily exist before the 19th century. But Buddhism existed before that. Hinduism is hundreds of thousands of years old. So how did Hinduism exist? Well, it's a Western construct because essentially what happened is people, colonialists, looked at a map of India and, and who lived in the Indus Valley and said, OK, well, we'll, we'll give this name to generally people who believe and act in the same way. And what was trying to happen is that we were, well, colonialists were trying to place a Christocentric structure onto um, things that didn't neatly fit. And, and that's why we need to challenge these neat little pockets of what we mean by religion. And it's really, really key in the things that we do. And one of the ways that we need to recognise that there is this imposition of the idea of religion and also the idea that religion is messy, we have to consider the words and the terminology that we use. So the words that we use have power. So in front of um, you, you will see various images. So in the blue circle, you will see um, the Kanda, which is the Sikh symbol, or the, the Nishan Sahib, which is, which is the flag of, of, of Sikhi. You'll have noticed I've just used two different terms to describe Sikhi or Sikhism. Sikhi is, is something of um, self-identification. Sikhism and perhaps ism itself is this Western construct, is this colonial imposition. So Sikhi, al although Sikhism is used all over the place and I've got lots of books by Sikhs that is, that, are, that is about Sikhism, it would be more correct to avoid that colonial terminology and use, for example, um, uh, Sikhi. 
But Rastafari has a similar example, and, and, and they're really, really interesting because Rastafari is actually a religion that grew up in opposition to colonialism and so would reflect, re reject, excuse me, an ism. The other um, images we have are the symbol of Hinduism, which is more correctly termed Sanatana Dharma or eternal law, eternal religion, eternal da Dharma, essentially. That's a better phraseology because that it, it's not about this structure that we're trying to. You know. Interesting, what, Wendy Dossett in the Theology Religious Studies Department gave a lecture last year and the, the, the question that she considered was, is pure land Buddhist? And in this way, what she was doing is saying, well, actually, she, she explores how Buddhism came to be in the Western mind. And, and she said, well, the way that Buddhism is presented with Siddhartha Gautama and everything else is a result of a Western ideal. The fact that there needed to be a founder and the religion needed to be based around him, because that's what happened in Christianity. Um, I had the, the, the reason one of the pagan symbols is there is I had a conversation with um, a student a, a few weeks ago and we were talking about she is pagan and really struggles to be seen to be a religion because it has such negative connotations. And so she would say she doesn't follow a religion. So we do have to challenge those ideas. And it's very interesting as, as we come up on the census as to the religions that will be outlined as, as possible answers on that. The, the two pictures to the right is, I think, one of the problems. So the, so the top picture is a yardstick. And essentially what I'm saying is that we use Christianity as a yardstick against which we judge other religions or against which we structure other religions in society. So our idea of a religion perhaps is very much influenced by what we see within Christianity. And even if that's not our idea, it is a historical idea that we've tried to do. And, and sometimes um, people do that with regards to, for example, Judaism. In the bottom right hand picture, you have a picture of the Passover story. Within Judaism, um, Jews were asked or the Hebrews were asked to paint um, a mark on the side of the door uh, of, of lamb's blood. This image is from a, a Christian retelling of that story because it's become a cross because it tells us about Jesus rather than about the Passover itself. And so sometimes we Christianize elements of religions because maybe because of our bias or because it fits that kind of structure. Now, I've shared this lots and this is the idea of the blind men and the elephant. And sometimes when this image is used, not by me, it's used to say, well, all religions are just the same bit of the same uh, of different bits of the same elephant. I think that's wrong because religions are different. They are competing, they have uh, different beliefs. But essentially, the reason that I use this element, elephant is, it's a Jane story, but essentially what we're doing is, as we look at this elephant, the first person is saying, an elephant, uh, the first blind man is saying, oh, it's hard, it's solid, it's rough, it's like a, a brick wall. Number two, it's like a sword. Number three, it's like a snake. Four, it's like a tree trunk. Five, it's like a palm leaf. And six, it's like a rope. Well, if this elephant is Christianity, or if this religion is Islam, or if this elephant is um, Hinduism, Sanatana Dharma, when we see a religion or when we meet someone who is religious, we're only seeing someone or an aspect of the elephant that is part of the elephant, not the complete elephant. We have to recognize that there is more outside of our experience. And sometimes, we get caught up and say, no, this is what the elephant is. So I had a conversation with um, uh, a leading Christian in the country and we were having a discussion about the Trinity, which yes, 98% of the world's Christians believe is the nature of God. I've just made up that figure, by the way. Um, but when we look at that, there are people who are Christian, believe Jesus is the son of God, live after his teachings, but don't believe in the Trinity. And he was saying, no, my interpretation of Christianity is the correct one. There can be no other kind of Christian outside of this worldview. And that's really, really problematic because we're then defining for other people what they believe and what the boundaries are. And, and I don't think that's our responsibility, um, whoever we are, essentially. And what happens is that it leads to a dichotomy. It leads to 
polarization. And so what you have, for example, within Judaism is we have Orthodox people who are religious, Reform Jews who are not. And that's nonsense. It is more uh, uh, that there's not this polarization. Reformed Jews are just as religious, generally speaking, as Orthodox Jews. They just interpret things slightly differently. But it leads to this polarization where Orthodox Jews do this, Reformed Jews don't do that. And so therefore, but, but religion is messy. So I was convinced one of the biggest differences was that Orthodox Jews don't have bat mitzvahs or, or coming of age ceremonies for girls. Until I met a couple of 70 year old women um, from Orthodox Judaism, who said, well, I had bat mitzvah when I was 13 or 12 or 13. So it's it, this this dichotomy, this drawing of lines or of boundaries is nonsense within religions because there's so much diversity. We have to use language of, of most, many, some in order to do that. And what's interesting, even beyond this, I was recently reading um, a book by Matt Green. He's uh, um, called Jew-ish. And so he, he talks about his life as a secular Jew. And what's really interesting is he gives a, 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 a presentation of Judaism that is that is messy. He says, look under the bonnet of most major religions and you'll find a system of beliefs that's at least internally consistent, the clues in the name, their faiths. But the engine for Judaism isn't faith, it's doubt. What keeps the vehicle moving isn't the belief that it will, but the heat generated from a thousand simultaneous disagreements. Um, and then it's at the end, what Judaism essentially amounts to is a 4,000 year argument. There's just so many different ways to be Jewish that if we try and just draw a chocolate box or paint a chocolate box, it misses the, the richness, the variety and the diversity that we find within Judaism. And sometimes uh, my background is as a teacher, we provide images to children that say this is what Jewish is and actually no, this is not necessarily all that there is. There's lots and lots of different ways to be Jewish, to be Hindu, to be Christian, to be Sikh, all of those things. And why it's important is that if we sideline religions and say no this is this is the way to be and you fall outside of that that chocolate box Darren McGarvey has suggested that enthusiasm to take part and be active in communities quickly dissipates when people realize that local democracy isn't really designed with them and that's about people realize that the interfaith organizations the structures that are there societal structures are there don't include them and so therefore why should I engage with that there's a really good example in a book that I recently read um, from from it's called Once Upon an Eden. It's a store. It's a story book. It's a narrative book of people who just kind of share their experiences of Eid within Islam. And Huda al um, she wrote this um, that's on the left hand side. And she was talking about Ayah as a, as a Shia Muslim. So Ayah tried to focus on following along in her textbook when the book described her sect the Shias as a radical group that broke away from mainstream Islam because they wanted the Prophet Muhammad's successor to descend from the family line, Ayat grew increasingly uneasy. The word radical made it sound as if she belonged to the wrong side, but there was so much more to the story of her religion's division. And that's really key because if we describe Shia Islam as a schismatic from mainstream or Sunni Islam, then that makes Shia almost the poorer brother. But actually, when you look at it from a Shia perspective, it's actually Sunnis that broke away. And so we have to be very careful in the way that we talk about things, because some of the language and some of the examples that we use exclude. Um, and and, and talk, uh, had an, a Twitter conversation with Huda and, and she says that this experience is based on her own experience from school. So we have to be very, very conscious that sometimes we accept a normative explanation of religion, but actually we need to challenge what is normative. And, and this kind of ex experience or example shows us that. It can also lead to some incredibly problematic events. So there is a group within Islam, and I know this is a contested area, then there will be lots of Muslims who say that no, they're not called the Ahmadiyya or the Ahmadi Muslim community. Now, whether they are Muslim or not is a question 
of, of a personal nature. However, we look at Ordinance 20 of the um, Pakistani constitution and it defines Ahmadiyya as non-Muslim. They're not allowed to use words such as mosque to, to um, describe the place of worship. They're not allowed to describe themselves as Muslims. There is a, a lot of persecution of, Mus of Ahmadiyya Muslims within some areas of Pakistan. And so if we don't have this big tent understanding of religion that actually there's different ways to be different things, then it leads to things like this, which is, I think, incredibly problematic and incredibly dangerous. Um, just briefly, and, and sometimes this is the way that life happens. So this is a conversation between Thor and Captain America. And essentially, so Thor halfway down is explaining how something happened. He says, my evil half bro brother Loki, a messenger from Asgard, came to warn me that he escaped from his bonds again and journeyed to Midgard to do everything he could to. And then Captain America interrupts saying, Thor, please, what? Just be quiet, I can't say that. Thor, you go to church every Sunday, Captain. What I've got to say is no stranger than that. So interestingly, there is an Odinist um, community within paganism, but you have this and you, what is it that makes the difference? Well, if someone has a bigger voice or a bigger community, it seems to be more acceptable and everything else becomes superstition. And, and this, this is the argument we use. And we have to be very aware that just because something is big and, and loud doesn't necessarily mean that they have the monopoly on what it is to be Christian, Muslim, Hindu, or even religious as a whole. So I've spent 20 minutes talking about an awful lot of stuff. And so kind of what impact does that have? Well, one of my favorite quotes is from the poet Yeats. I have spread my dream under your dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. So when we interact with people, when we talk about people's religions, when we talk with people about their religions, we are talking about things that are very deeply sacred to them. We shouldn't assume the knowledge that we have. We should also recognize that just because we have this view of what a certain group are and how they behave, we need to actually exercise some intellectual humility and think, yeah, I don't know everything and I can learn lots from you and I need to tread carefully because, or tread softly even, because these things that I'm talking about are sacred to you and we need to recognize the diversity and the messiness of religion. Okay, thank you for your time tonight. I think I now hand over to Claire for some questions. Yeah, thank you very much, James. That was really interesting. Um, and we've had loads of questions in as well. So I'll jump straight in with the questions that we've had. Um, so the first question goes back to um, towards the beginning of the presentation when you were talking about the isms, the Sikhism and Hinduism. Um, and this person has asked, rather than avoid the isms, isn't it best to teach both and explain why they, presumably they mean by that the students, the people you're teaching will see the isms in use? Yes, very much so, because we can't suddenly go from, I mean, going from Sikhism to Sikhi, OK, I think most people would pick up on what that was. Going from Hinduism to Sanatana Dharma, what are you talking about, James or, or whoever? Yeah, it, it, it may not be picked up on quite so much. And so, yes, it's important to recognise both, but also recognise how people would perhaps self-identify. And, and that's, I suppose, structured with, with a bit of a problem in the sense that some people and some communities will have become so used to talking about isms that that's just a natural part of their lexicon anyway. So we we do have to recognise it. I don't think we're going to do away with the Buddhism, Sikhism, Hinduism immediately. I mean, I'm, I'm writing some books at the moment and I'm talking about teaching Sikhism and I'm talking about teaching Hinduism. But it's within that book, it recognises that there are challenges and we need to, to do both. Um, yes. So that was a very long way of saying, yes, I agree. That was a good answer. Thank you, James. I should have answered that question. Um, the second question is about um, what you were saying about um, Orthodox Jews and Reformed Jews. So this person has said um, they've never heard anyone say that Orthodox Jews are religious, but that Reformed Jews are not. And where did you get this interpretation from? OK, so this was from 
my education, but also from the first few years of my teaching. So it may just be within my my own experience that it seemed to be a lazy way of saying, OK, so Orthodox Jews are the people that live the religion very strictly, hence the term Orthodox and other people and Reformed Jews are people who have just interpreted it in, in light of modern day, which is true, but because they don't want to be restricted by as many laws. But actually, the reality is very, very different. And so, yes, it, it's great that this person has never heard that. And it may just have been a, a reflection of where I lived and where I studied and everything else. Um, but it's sometimes and sometimes we do it in, in GCSE. I have seen um, I'm involved with exams on a, on a small level. And so sometimes I see that in some of the responses that come through in the exams as well. They're orthodox people. But it, Orthodox people say no and, and reform say yes. And in some ways that dichotomy is also shown when it comes to Catholics and Protestants. And I know both of those are huge umbrella groups, but Catholics say no and Protestants say yes. Well, actually, no, it's much more nuanced and much more complicated than that. Um, so it's great that, that that isn't being seen in schools elsewhere. That's that's fantastic. OK, that's, that's good. Um, and somebody has asked, um, you know, thinking about your history as a teacher of RE, um, what do you think we should be teaching about religions? Um, and is the current way of teaching religions as Sikhism, Hinduism, Christianity, etc., too rigid? Should we be looking at teaching themes without labels? The problem is that when we teach themes, sometimes we fall into default themes such as festivals, founders, rites of passage, all of which kind of reinforce the fact that religions have these areas. And so I don't think any one way is perfect. I think in teaching okay, about Hinduism or about Sikhism is really, really beneficial, but only in, in the way that it impacts on life today. So I, when, when Sikhism is taught, for example, or when Buddhism is taught or when Christianity is taught, I, I want it to be taught as a lived reality. So not as a history lesson, but how is it lived by people today? What impact does the life of Jesus have on a Christian today? In many, many different ways. And there's an approach to teaching RA. There's lot, and, and I think there's lots of different approaches that we should and can take. But one is called the ethnographic approach, where we recognise individual voices and in using individual voices in the things that we teach and do, we're able to experience that diversity. Now, I'm someone that likes to teach a religion at once and kind of explore that religion in depth, um, whatever we mean by the term religion. So I think that's that's the way that I've done it and that's the way that I do it. But I recognise there's lots of other ways that we can go about doing that as well. But we have to be careful that we don't throw everything out just because we're trying to to fit this neat structure. Yeah, the next question sort of draws on that a little bit as well. So they've asked with the massively diverse nature of religion, as far as the RE curriculum is concerned, where should we start and where should we stop? You know, what should we cover and what shouldn't we cover? <sighs> I think I think we need to because uh, there's the discussion in RE at the moment that, that some people will be aware, aware of about religion and worldviews and that is extending in some ways what we teach by including things such as humanism, um, non-religious worldviews and different things which I think is fantastic and I think is is very useful. Um, I've written a book that's called Beyond the Big Six Religions because if you look at the way the RE curriculum is structured it is um, about Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism and Sikhism. And I think in the book I talk about Rastafari, I talk about Jain, I talk about humanism and paganism as examples of things that we can use in Baha'i. So I think all of these religions can be talked about, but we have to be very aware of why we are giving preferential treatment to certain religions. And the problem is there are invested voices in um, in RE from faith traditions that will shout very loudly that you can't reduce the amount that you're talking about us to, to give it to someone else. And it's very interesting because if you look at the 2011 census, the seventh biggest religion in the UK, according to that census, is paganism. I cheat a bit with the figures because I, I kind of use everybody that's under that umbrella term. And it's quite significant number. And then you have Baha'i who um, are actually quite small, 
I think they should be studied, but they have a very big voice and they're on lots of agreed syllabuses around the country. And so they will be talked about. Why? Because Baha'is have been very good at getting representation on what are called sacres and everything else and, and getting their beliefs on the system on, in, in the curriculum. And I think that's great, but I think there's so much diversity that essentially we have to talk about the contested nature of religion. We have to talk about the lived reality of religion, but as to the vehicles we use to do that, which are the religions themselves, um, I think that's a very debated area that I can't provide an answer for, I'm afraid. Uh, it is, it's a difficult area and, and the next question sort of follows on from that again um, and, and this person has asked how important is it for us in RE to unpack the history behind RE so the history of the empire and how it shaped Hinduism for example or should we just leave that to history and if we do do it how do we do it in an RE way and not in a history way yeah I, th I think that's really interesting I think if we could trust that, that sounds terrible if we could trust history to do it but I think if we can trust the history curriculum to do it I think history teachers could do it incredibly well but whether the history curriculum actually would challenge that and so it, it I'm going to switch complete tack a moment and almost contradict myself because when I talk about teaching the Holocaust as an example, I think we need to leave the history teachers to teach it as a historical event and our re teachers need to teach it as a challenge to faith within the context of Judaism and, and people like Viktor Frankl and others who have searched for meaning and literally his book is Man's Search for Meaning in that sense. So in an ideal world, yes, we leave history to talk about the colonial um, definition of religion and all of those things and how Hinduism came to be. I don't think that's on the curriculum and I don't think it probably ever will be. So we need to at least mention it and make it part of the things that we do, especially if we're saying, well, actually Hindus would prefer the term Sanatana Dharma, then we can utilise that um, colonial background to explore it. And, and staying on colonialism, so so the, our next our next audience member has asked, um, has the result of colonialism distorted the very essence of Christianity itself and subsequently affected our view of other religions? Say that again, sorry. So has the result of colonialism distorted the very essence of Christianity itself? Um, it could well have done. I mean, I'm not, um, if we look at the history of colonialism and I look back and I think, all of these things were done in the name of Christianity. So um, almost the forced conversion of, of some groups of people and, and um, the Christian justification for slavery. It certainly, Christianity was not, I think in colonial times necessarily the way that Jesus taught it. But then again, I suppose that raises the question is the Christianity I follow today, the way that Jesus taught it. And so rather than kind of, I suppose, dwelling on, on its, its very um, odd nature that kind of arose out of colonialism, we, we then have to look at, well, what impact does today and today's values have on Christianity? And what are we doing to address things that we've seen in the past that perhaps were not good expressions of Christianity as well? Maybe I've answered that as a Christian rather than as, as an RE teacher, maybe. Okay. Um, our next question is, should the oversimplification of worldviews within religions, for example, conservative, liberal, be addressed and rejected by examples to prevent this from rendering a disservice to so many faiths? Um, I think one of the issues with exam boards, and, and I, I got this question in response to a, trick, a tweet actually I put out about this session, is that exam boards need to recognise this diversity and all of those things. It's actually not within the exam board's remit. What exam boards do is they get, a, what happened last time is they got a, a document of content that needed to be covered that was given to them by the DfE, by the Department for Education, and the exam boards could only work with what was in that um, document. They weren't allowed to deviate from it, I know, because I tried and was told off. Um, and so therefore, it's it's more about how government views religion and worldviews. And I think there was a there was a recent consultation that was put out to do with religion in the time of coronavirus. And and the government put out a definition of religion that was wholly inadequate. And it excluded 
um, non-religious worldviews, it excluded Buddhism, it excluded all number of people, but it was written by people who don't have an understanding of, and so I think um, the government as a whole needs to be much more religiously literate and actually understand. Now they will say, well, this document that we produced was written by the faith communities themselves. Yes, that's true, but which parts of the faith communities are you asking? You only ask the people with the biggest voice. And, and so how do we recognise that diversity? So um, I can't remember what the question was, but I hope I've answered it. OK, um, thank you. And the next question, haven't themes been imposed and continue to be imposed by, you have to forgive me if I get the, the pronunciation this wrong, um, is it Natra, Sacre and the C of E who still conveniently influence RE today? Um, I'm not sure it necessarily imposed themes, though I think themes are seen to be quite a positive thing. But I think within RE, more than any other subject, and, and I, I'm willing to be disproven on that, there are interest groups. And I think um, there are groups that are Christian in nature, and, and the Church of England are one of them, who have a vested interest in RE and who have done lots of things to support the curriculum and these can be seen to be very negative because for example there's there's something called understanding christianity which has had mixed reviews within the primary school some people see it as amazing because it's very deep and does deep learning with regards to theology and other things but one of the issues with it is it's a particular flavor of christianity or a particular interpretation the problem is that government don't provide um, any kind of support for RE and so there's no kind of independent body that and I'm not sure there can ever be an independent body when it comes to religion to be honest that will influence what's taught in the classroom it will always be the loudest voices and I think sacres have a responsibility it depends who's the loudest voice on the sacre natre is um, a particular approach to religious education. They do an awful lot, which is fantastic, but it does um, facilitate or reinforce a particular approach to RE, which some people don't like. And so there, there needs to be other competing voices, if you like, or there needs to be a national body that is independent. But again, is that actually possible in RE? Okay. So we've got a comment here that says thank you for mentioning the invested voices um, and this person goes on to ask some people argue that you need to teach essentialism before you teach broader diversity how would you approach that kind of argument? Um, I think so there's two approaches within RE where you talk about fun the phonological approach which is Ninian Smart and you teach all of those seven dimensions and then you can work out what an individual does and yes that works so yes teaching essentialism before diversity not a problem but I think it also works in the other way as well I think you can talk about the diversity and look at five different people's experiences and then still explore what it is to be a Christian and what concepts lie at the heart of Christian belief or Hindu belief or whatever else that might be so I think both ways work but whichever way happens the diversity has to be included I think the problem happens when you talk about the essentialism and skip the diversity and, and you stop at the and you stop at the essentialism um and we've got a comment from mina who i think was, is referring to something you said earlier on um and she says perhaps this reveals the importance of multi and interdisciplinary arenas to embrace a more holistic understanding for teachers and their students when it comes to human experience big questions and religious and faith traditions yes yeah, so there's there's some work at the moment within our read there was the norfolk agreed syllabus that came out a couple of years ago uh, there's a new book come out by Dawn Cox and another lady whose name I've forgotten, so I apologise, uh, making every RE lesson count. And they talk about different lenses within RE. There's also some work down at Exeter um, to do with um, researchers in RE. And you explore religion from a theological perspective, from an anthropological ex perspective, and take all of those different things and kind of explore it. And, Yes, because each uh, sociological perspective, because each of those lenses focuses on a different aspect and that kind of explores all the different aspects of religion and not just one particular thing. And that's almost going back to the way 
religion used to be viewed, which is influencing every aspect of life, which I, is, I think, the reality. Because if I think about my own faith, it's not a bolt on, it's a part of who I am. It determines what I watch on television, how I interact with other people, what I do, all of those things. And so I, I, I think, yes, that's a good approach, but we're only now at the beginning of how we begin to, to kind of explore that and do that within the classroom. OK, and someone else has asked, how do you see evangelization sitting with accepting people of all faiths? Now, that's a really interesting question, and, and maybe I need to explore that from a faith perspective, because I belong to it to an evangelizing faith. I, um, um, my son is on a proselyte, a proselyting mission at the moment. And so, yes, that that kind of comes within that perspective. And so, well, how do those two things sit? neatly in my life of, of respecting other people's faiths but i think it depends on what you mean by proselytization if it means by having conversations with people and introducing your religion to them and saying okay this is something we have then that's that's fine i think because a person is free to kind of say yes no and i'm happy with mine but actually what i find most valuable in my conversations with other people is what i learn about myself so when I'm having a conversation with a Muslim, yes, I'm learning more about Islam and I'm learning more about um, my friend, but at the same time, I'm also learning more about me and who I am in relation to that. And so I don't think the two are anathema to one another, but I know I'm very biased in that perspective. And I know why other people would say in a multicultural world or multi-faith world where we have to show respect for each religion then proselytizing is problematic. Um, I'm one of those people that has to walk that tightrope and think actually both are both are fine within my world and within my life. OK, um, and the next question is, I mean, it's, it's a wider question that I think is being asked um, asked across, you know, across the whole curriculum, uh, across the country at the moment, is why are British values allowed to continue to be referred to and taught as positive? By doing this, are we ignoring racist history? Are we ignoring colonialism? Um, I don't know how to answer that one. British values are interesting. They were introduced um, at a time where the country was going through some issues and I think a political party needed to um, reclaim what it was to be British from um, more radical aspects of society. So I think in that sense, is it positive? I don't know. There's issues I have with them. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the British values is tolerance, which is, I think, the very basic and the very minimum approach to other religions and other people that we should have. Um, the law, one of them is about laws on which they're based, and so that may reinforce those. So I understand why they're there. I think it maybe doesn't do the things that it's supposed to do. And I think there are just general values that we can explore that are important within society without labelling them necessarily British values. Um, but it's an interesting debate that will take far longer than we've got now. I think we could probably do a whole lecture just on that, James. Um, so the next person has said, thank you for mentioning the problems with understanding Christianity. I found it to be an incredibly flawed approach. How can the RE community rescue the subject from the controlling power that funds RE, i.e. the C of E and Christian Trust that fund and control it? OK, um, I don't have as negative view of that as the questioner does. I think okay. that those groups do do positive things. It has raised and, and understanding Christianity has, I think, provided more challenge within RE, within the primary school, and it asks more of children and of teachers. So I think that's positive. But I do understand that there are very big voices, whoever whoever they may be, who have a very big influence. And I don't think it's just limited to the to the voices that I've already mentioned. I think there's people with very large voices who are pushing an agenda. And I may be one of I don't think I have a big voice, but I may be pushing an agenda. Um, and so there needs to be. I don't know. I've not really thought that through, but maybe there needs to be a an independent body. And again, it's difficult to get an independent body in religious education um, who oversees things and who's responsible for RE. The DfE needs to do that, but we know that the curriculum and the DfE are not neutral. 
um, they have a political background against which they function as well. So I'm not sure there's any solution, but I do think some of the smaller voices need to be heard in order to drive RE forward a little bit more. Okay, so I've got one final question, James, before a couple of comments um, before we finish. So the final question is, is theology with all its baggage a credible disciplinary lens or is it really best suited to being a substantive part of the subject, e.g. should students do theology or should they study theology theologies? Oh, now, so um, that's a very nuanced question. So um, I have behind me a book about, um, is called God Colourblind by Anthony Reddy and it's about black theology and so that's where so well as i'm reading that i'm studying theology i'm looking at what other people have said about it my phd practiced theology and so put the so so i actually did theology rather than studied it i think both approaches have their place have their place um I think maybe more what we do within schools is study theology in the sense that we study what other people have said and we study how it's applied and all of those things. But I think there there is a place for children and for adults to actually begin to think more theologically and begin to think through those issues. And so um, there's an approach by Bob Bowie down at um, Canterbury University who talks about hermeneutics and how we read and how we have children read texts or scripture and so that's something that I think is doing theology and I think that's a very positive thing so I think in essence both are acceptable approaches within RE it just depends on what we're doing and then we then have to think well is theology a distinctly Christian approach um, and is the way that theology is applied to Islam or Hinduism just reflective of that Christian approach and maybe there's a different way of doing theology or terming it in, in other religious traditions. OK, so I've just got one comment from Mina again. So Mina um, has commented that she said, I love your response to your faith. Um, you're referring to learning from and learning about, and it seems such an important element that has been pushed out in secondary, cur secondary curriculums because of pressures to educate on measurables. Um, rather than you know learning to formal assessments rather than just learning from um, from experiences one of Mina's comments and I'll just finish with this another comment from an anonymous viewer um, and they've simply said thank you for answering the questions very well and I think that's something that we all echo James I think you've had you've had an amazingly engaged audience which has been brilliant this evening um, and I think they've really put you through your paces with all their questions so thank you very much um, for answering those what I'm going to do now is just hand back to Katie just to wind um, wind the session up for the day but thank you very much for your time today James and for a really interesting presentation no problem and thank you to everyone else as well yeah so exactly what Claire said there was lots of questions there which was really good um, so that does round things up for today. Um, so we really hope you've enjoyed the session um, and found it useful. Um, and we are actually running more kitchen sessions um, throughout the end of this month and March as well. Um, so do check the schedule on our, on our website and sign up for any others that you're interested in. And um, thank you for watching. <laughs>